Alright, this is the wrong project, and oh boy, the <laughs> the deadline for the deadline for mega favorite number is well, it's today, <laughs> and I don't know what time zone it is. So, oh, I'm just gonna wing it. I'm just gonna wing it, and who knows what's gonna happen? Did I miss any Discord messages? Let me see. Didn't watch. What are they talking about? Oh, they're talking about the, oh, whatever. I don't care about that right now. So, um, as you can see from the title of this video, this, uh, I believe I'm going to call this Pendulum Math uh, Part 1. So, although this is a mega favorite number video, this is talking about the concepts of pendulums in Super Mario 64, and there's so much to talk about. I don't know how long this video is going to be, but there's going to be like many parts. Depends on how far we get with our mathematical proofs on uh, the various statements about the pendulum. And, uh, and the rabbit hole we're about to drop into is, uh, oh, it's massive. So first of all, I'm going to explain the pendulum to you, but you can also watch Panon's video about this thing, which is probably more organized because it's text, so it's all scripted. I am not scripted. I am the most unscripted ever. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to tell you about this uh, whole thing. So it's a tight and uh, enjoy. So, Super Mario 64 is uh, is one of the thir uh, first uh, 3D platformer games that's uh, ever been released. So they had to they try to emulate a lot of uh, physics concepts like like you know gravity and all that. Uh, but there's also certain things like uh, they try to emulate the Doppler effect. <laughs> they Kind of. I, I don't really understand the exact way they did it, but I know that it's kind of off, so it's not it's not perfect. There's also I'm gonna stop this uh, pause this video. Oh, there's also bullies. They actually emulate a uh, elastic collision, and I mean you wouldn't know because they cap off the speed. <laughs> and actually, Mario's running right here. You see you see Mario's running. Uh, you see it a few times here. That actually, uh, that actually uses a recurrence relation. That says that, like in terms of time, Mario's speed exponentially decays towards uh, forty-seven point three, I believe. But they cap it off at thirty-two, so you didn't even see that either. <laughs> um, but you know, there's all these math concepts in the code of Super Mario Sixty Four. Like, uh, maybe I should have brought this up in this other window. Uh, I don't know what tab this was. Uh, well, anyway, there's just we have all the code here of Super Mario 64, so we can look into any of that. Today we're gonna look at the pendulum. So the pendulum. Now, now I know what Matthew might be thinking we're talking about when we're talking about the pendulum, but throw that all away because this thing's a, a bit whack. This thing is uh, it tries to emulate uh, it tries to simulate the conservation of energy but it fails. For example, like, I mean, you see how it pauses before it swings? Like that, a real pendulum doesn't do that. I mean, maybe like you can damp the pendulum. Yeah, okay, fine, you can you can artificially make it do this, but the point is that it's, uh, there's a lot about it that's off. I mean, already in here, you can see how the pendulum moves each uh, frame, because, you know, this is a video game, this is a computer program. Time is discretized in the discretized to 30 frames per second. So one frame, the pendulum moves like this slight amount, and then it speeds up because it's uh, swinging faster and faster. Around here, it switches from accelerating to decelerating, but since time is discretized, the moment it flips from accelerating to decelerating can't be exactly zero. I mean, right here it seems pretty close, but it's still not exact. Here it's off here, it's way off. Um, it's uh, its amplitude. Each swing is different. And so, let me get you the 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 equation, the, re the relation between each uh, amplitude swing. That is, uh, I'm just gonna have to go up here. Um, here, let me try to highlight it. Highlighting is bad in LaTeX, I know, but uh, yeah, right there. Um, if we say x sub i right here is, uh, oh god, I cannot highlight anything. 
uh, I do warn that I swear. <laughs> like, actually, watch as I say that, and then I just don't swear the rest of the video. Um, but x sub i is our initial um, pendulum swing amplitude. Then we say x sub i plus 1 is our next amplitude. And a is our acceleration right here. So this whole thing is the relation between each swing. And uh, and the, the pendulum, like despite all its flaws, is actually fine most of the time. But TikTok Clock has a secret setting that uh, you just saw, actually. Um, it's there, There's the random setting where every object in TikTok Clock behaves randomly. So if you just... Uh, well, well, I won't say how you orange and manipulate. You just cause some dust. But uh, uh, the pendulum swings at an acceleration of 13 sometimes and 42 sometimes. And it just depends every swing. Um, and so A, A can be 13 or 42. Right now, it's just swinging at the same uh, speed. Come on, is it ever going to change? I, I need to show you a fast swing. What about this one? I, I'm trying. I'm speeding up the the emulator, by the way, right now. There we go. That's a fast swing. It's the faster swing is actually uh, less likely to happen than the slower swing. There's a lot of math you can do about uh, probability with this, but I'm going to go over none of the probability today. That is an entire video in itself, and an entire other rabbit hole about this thing. I will talk about nothing about the probability in this video. This this is not about the probability because if we're going to assume uh, you know how tool assisted speedruns work, we can we have full control over the game. We can choose uh, what acceleration will occur each swing, 13 or 42, fast swing or slow swing. Um, and so this uh, uh, this relation between one swing and the next is uh, what we'll be using. And uh, there's a few things about this I have to talk about. So it seems like starting from x naught, like x sub zero, we will. There's two ways to do a swing, 13 and 42, and and you will come up with two new amplitudes, uh, right? And then you can do uh, you can do 13 or 42 and apply this to this function again and get two different equations, right? So now you have four new amplitudes. But that's not how this works. You see when you apply if when you apply an amplitude into the same equation with the same acceleration twice, you'll just come back to the same uh, amplitude. I can describe this to you in a way that is intuitive, but right now I am not I don't have a lot of time, so I'll just show this to you by using f1 is the is a swing function that where we assume acceleration is 13. So we do two of, of the same acceleration here, and here you go. Like just You don't have to take my word for it. It's right there. Let's try this again, but with uh, F2. There we go. It's the same again. And, uh, and so we see here that uh, you'll just come back to the same uh, spot. So what you want to do if you want to change your amplitude over and over again is to keep switching between 13 and 42 to generate new amplitudes. So generate new amplitudes, generate new amplitudes. Uh, we can just keep going like this and we have some crazy function. <laughs> um, oh, oh, let's go even further. Let's go even further. Oh, what's happened? <laughs> what happened? Is it? <laughs> it's broken. Um, it's going to take a very long time to generate this function now. Uh, man, that's crazy, actually. I think I, I think we will leave this alone for now. <laughs> it's broken. So, uh, you'll, you'll just have to wait a very long time for the graph to generate. So, anyway, um, I actually, I actually do need to go back to Desmos. Okay, here's the... <laughs> Here's the generated graph. Now let's just delete that. There is one exception to this uh, thing I told you about, where using the same acceleration leads to coming back to it just comes back to the identity function. Except that's not true for some 
specific amplitudes and I need to be kind of precise to show this to you. It is uh, right here. There we go. Yeah, you see it just jump like that? It's all the way at the top. Do you see it? Do you see the dot all the way up there? 13-78. Let me just move it around so you can see it. Yeah, it's up there. You see it kind of a flashing dot up there. There's more. Uh, I believe it's uh, 39. Yes, 39. 39? 39. Oh, it's a bit too high. Um, will I be able to show it to you? We'll find out. Oh, there it is. Yeah, you see it. You see it all the way up there. So certain numbers don't come back to to their original number if you use the same ampl uh, acceleration twice, like this. And these numbers, I call them the the real numbers. I will. You'll see why in like two minutes, don't worry. Um, for now, we're just calling them the real numbers. These real numbers are equal to, and I think I'll write them down here, acceleration multiplied by n times n plus 1 over 2. In other words, they're the acceleration multiplied by a triangle number. I, I'm just going to assume you know what a triangle number is, okay? It's, it's the sum from 1 to n. So it's uh, equal to a, equal to a sum Let's go from 1 to n. <laughs> Let's use this. Okay, there we go. So this is what it is. Heck, I'll, I'll just use x if that's what you prefer. I, I don't know what you prefer. k. You prefer k, right? k is a good number for this. Yeah, that's right. Any fans of k? <laughs> um, all right. Um, so what was my next topic? Right. So we basically know all of the real numbers now is that uh, a can be 13 or 42, and we can generate an infinite number of uh, of triangle numbers. So um, this is um, ignore everything up here. In fact, I'm just going to delete it so you don't get overwhelmed or something like that. But we have a sequence of real numbers down here. P pretty simple. It's just 13, 39, 78. It's it's all 13 multiplied by a triangle number. And on the right side, we have real 42 which has 42 multiplied by any uh, any uh, of these uh, triangle numbers. You know, I only learned what a triangle number is today. <laughs> I, I'm sorry I'm a, such a math noob, but uh, I knew what they were. I never knew what they were called. Okay, it's just <laughs> Trust me, I, I can math a little bit. Um, so every single one of these real numbers, you can choose to, to diverge away from it. Just, just go this direction if you want. Or, or here. Um, the pendulum in Super Mario 64, when it spawns, obviously it doesn't start at uh, amplitude equals zero, because, oh hell, let me just uh, enter. Is hell a swear word, by the way? Let me just, <laughs> no, just please, please, just, it's okay. So uh, let me just save state here and show you. Here, you see it? very slightly oscillating. This is what small amplitude, uh, move this around here. This is what small amplitude uh, oscillation looks like. It looks stupid. And don't worry, if you just keep going, it'll become bigger and bigger. Um, we're at amplitudes of 700, 800. Um, it increases. But uh, obviously this is not where the, ampli uh, where the swinging starts. Actually, it starts at angle 6500. Actually, let me just pause this. 6500, let me set angular velocity to zero. This is what where it starts. So I'm not like starting off with like uh, realistic angles right now. These, uh, But we are going to start from angle equals zero and we're just going to see where the pendulums can, when the, where the pendulum can go starting from here to left and right. And for each of these we can branch upwards like this. So each of these are called branches. Uh, this we have the green uh, blocks with their numbers. They're called rail numbers, and each of these rail uh, red blocks have their own numbers, which we will call uh, branch numbers. I hope my microphone is working. By the way, yes, I will check it right now just to make sure. Okay, good. Hopefully, there's nothing to do with the volume control right now, I guess, like volume balancing. My last video was pretty bad at that. 
there's there's no problem with that right now. Um, so okay, let, let's get back to this. We have branches, and let me show you one of these branches, starting with 13. Um, this is the Pendulum TDM spreadsheet, which uh, we start the branch from 13. So we start at zero, and uh, because of a 13 acceleration, we swing to 13. And from here, um, what happens to the branch? There's uh, two possibilities. So let me show you. Uh, let me show you actually the simpler one to explain is when we start from 39 and you eventually reach 78 78 here it is all the way down here um, control F delete that so this is how long the branch is but uh, if we look at the map it starts from 39 comes and, and loops all the way back here and you can go the other direction too. So you can actually decrease your uh, you can actually decrease your uh, amplitude, I guess. And that's the first type. The second type, well, I just called it the one where you start from 13 acceleration, for example, and you go up, and then something happens, and you come back to 13 again. And that's just what I called it. It's kind of a, just an isolated branch, but it's actually more interesting that because this purple number is what I call a branch end and so now I will show you the the second type of branch you see here the amplitude rep uh, repeated once uh, this green uh, cell d denotes that this uh, number repeated and then you see it goes 26 16 36 6 7 and look at the previous amplitudes we just uh, swung from 16, 36, 6, 7, 35, and, and it's the same. It's mirrored. It's mirrored from right here. And uh, that's pretty significant. In other words, we go up this way, and then we come back down. Uh, these branch ends, these purple numbers I, I call the branch enders, always have the form of the acceleration divided by 2 multiplied by a number squared. So. I will write here a over two oh, over two n squared. I guess just to uh, make it a bit more consistent, I can write like this. Oops. So there's something important about this before I move on to the our mega favorite number, which this is a little bit of a sidetrack, but it's pretty pretty interesting. So I really want to go over it. When a is equal to thirteen. There's a chance this thing is not an integer, so so let's just replace 13 right here. Then n, for, for this to be an integer, n has to be an even number, and that's uh, that's pretty crazy because every uh, we have a certain number of branch, uh, sorry, of rail numbers here, which begin which generates a branch each of them, but this proves that there are not an equal number of branch generators as there are branch enders which is proof which which by itself is already proof that some uh, branches don't end by a branch ender number not by a purple number so there's only one other option is that two of these branches must connect like this there's no branch ender only two branch generators uh, connected to each other in, in a loop. So we have two examples of such with this uh, black arrow and the purple arrow up uh, here. So that's really fascinating. Like I didn't know why these loops occur, but this is pretty much why. And I just want to point out, every single one of these branches must have a limited number of uh, branch numbers in them. This, the sequence does not go infinitely for any of these. Uh, and that's just, uh, I guess that's just common sense to me. I never really rigorously proved that. So that's another thing that you can try to prove for yourself. There's also a th claim I have about the ratio between uh, branches that end at a branch ender or branches that loop into another branch, that, that connect to another branch. So And that ratio is about uh, about 44%. 
I believe it's something to do with the square root of 13 over 42. Let me actually write that down. The square root of 13 over 42. Uh, 42. Um, actually, I believe it is very closely related to this. In fact, another claim I'll make before I move on is I believe these uh, the length of each branch is about like I I believe it increases at approximately the square root of n. So um, here are all the the lengths of each uh, branch that I just graphed here. This this big this big big uh, graph. Um, I don't see any pattern to it. <laughs> so uh, uh, you're just if if you've become interested in this, this is I find this interesting. Okay. Um, so I believe that's uh, that's all about this part of what I want to talk about. Now I want to talk about uh, the main dish of this video. There is one more thing peculiar about this. Uh, about this structure is that eventually as we're going to the left we're gonna come across a number that is equal to some number towards the right in other words rail 13 and rail 42 are gonna connect somewhere purely just from the green numbers the set of rail 13 numbers and the set of rail 42 numbers has an intersection that is not null what I'm saying is that I think I've described this in several ways, but there's it's going to be really interesting. Is that there's a number such that 13 times a triangle number is equal to 42 times a triangle number. Yes, let's use a different uh, integer for this, like this. So uh, the significance of this it is not useful for SM64 as far as I know right now. This was basically just just a, a curiosity for my own sake. If it becomes useful, so be it. If it isn't, then it isn't. Such is the way of how I how I go about my hobby. Um, so uh, what, what so far what I do know about the significance of this is that when you reach a number such that is equal to this, let's just call it x, then um, you don't have to do RNG manipulation to make the pendulum go to angle equals zero, which, uh, if you recall from the start of start of video, it accelerates the pendulum more every time this uh, pendulum touches uh, angle equals zero. Did I talk about that, dude? I need to remember that again. Did I talk about that? Did I? Did I talk? Oh, I, I did bring up uh, rail numbers, but I didn't tell you the significance of this. Every time, th so, yeah, I told you about how these numbers jump up, right? This is actually useful. Let me go to 39 again, just, just for the hell of it. Yeah, 39. This kind of jumping up in uh, amplitude is actually useful to us because, look at this. <laughs> how is this not useful to us? Look at this. Look at this. How is this not useful to us? You're telling me? Like, speedrunners, well, not speedrunners because this takes a long time to make, but uh, Pan and Coke with the ABC trials has used this property of uh, pendulums for for various uh, things as it is. Um, well, not exactly. It doesn't look like this, but like, look at how it goes all the way 360 degrees. That's useful to us. So, um, this happens when uh, when this pendulum hits angle equals zero and that happens through one of these real numbers so to do this we need to do RNG manipulation so that we get uh, acceleration magnitude of 13 every time but if we solve this equation and get uh, a solution of X then we find a, a certain amplitude where where you don't, uh, where you don't even have to RNG manipulate, because 13 or 42 will both result in uh, landing on angle equals zero. This, uh, the usefulness of this is really not something I'm going to argue about because it's not. It's just uh, I 
find this to be one significance of this uh, finding this number. So it's not important. So <laughs> we don't you don't have to worry about that too much. This is not any motivation for why I am doing any of this. So let's get to it. Um, here are the definitions that I already talked about. You see here about uh, I'll call them real amplitudes. I think I'll call these branch amplitudes and branch. I actually have been changing the the terminologies for a while as I do this. And uh, this claim is not true. Uh, actually, forget this entire paragraph. Don't just just ignore it. I believe I have to update that. So this little thing is our final boss, the main dish of our uh, video of this YouTube video today. We are going to solve this little equation. And how? Oh my God! Um, so I gotta give a big shout out to uh, Trex and Creolite for finding the solutions to to this uh, this problem. And I'll show you. Um, first of all, is there a problem with the? Uh, oh, um, here. Let me. Oh, I don't know how to LaTeX. I hate LaTeX. <laughs> no, it's okay. LaTeX pretty. It's not that bad. So. Let's start with the equation and let's multiply by 2. So, I mean, of course we don't want fractions, so here we go. And now we want to complete the squares. So n squared plus n plus, that's right, 1 over 4. And we want to balance that out, so we also subtract a 13 minus 4. And we do the same for the right-hand side. Now we move the, the constants to the right side and all the, these, uh, all, all the, we, we you know, we move the nor the normal numbers to the right side, and we move all these variable things to the left hand side. All right. Now we multiply by four because we don't want constants again. Uh, sorry, fractions again. So everything's a uh, natural like integer right now. Now we multiply by forty-two. Why? What's the significance of multiplying by forty-two? Well, now we can replace some of these numbers. We can replace this entire part, forty-two squared times an odd number squared as x squared and we can replace this little odd number as y squared so we end up with a Pell equation that looks like like this equals uh, 1218 uh, actually I will draw uh, I'll write another line for this x oh let me just copy paste I'd rather not use my hand too much 218 there you go. So that's the that's a Pell equation, and uh, if you don't know what a Pell equation is, I am unfamiliar with it too until today. Well, yesterday. Hey, it's been less than twenty four hours. Okay. <laughs> um. So this thing is uh, pretty magical because if you can find one solution for this equation, you can generate an infinite sequence. You can generate an infinite amount of solutions, all you want. Uh, and I believe you can get every solution this way. Um, so the next step we're going to do is using brute forcing. Trex brute force for the base case solution which is 701 x equals 701 and y equals 30. This makes it so that this uh, Pell equation equals 1. And this is going to be important because what we're going to do next is called Brahmagupta's identity which you can look it up on uh, Google, uh, uh, sorry Wikipedia. This is how you spell Brahmagupta I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but I believe I did. I'm just going to assume. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be confident, but I, I, this looks simple, all right? <laughs> um, so um, if you use Brahmagupta's identity, this right-hand side of these two equations will be multiplied. And uh, you, you have to do a bunch of stuff with the left-hand side, which uh, I'll show you here. First of all, we, need a, we first need a base case for our actual Pell equation. You can call it the generalized Pell equation. So it's obvious that x needs to be, for, for our solution, x needs to be 42 times an odd number, and y needs to be just a plain old odd number. So the smallest solutions we have is just 42 times 1, and y is just 1. So you just, and since it can be an integer, it can be positive or negative, plus minus 42 and plus minus 1. So um, that's our first equation. Now we use Brahmagupta's identity. 
And this is what you do with Brahmagupta's identity. You use 701 and 30, and you multiply it with the base case uh, solution. And also you use 546. That's actually a, it's like actually a constant there that matters. And so you can generate all the solutions you want. And finally, here's the big thing. <laughs> this is the final result of what we have here. The result of everything we've done so far. Um, so we start with 42 and 1, or we can start with negative 42 and 1, either anything works. We have our identity here, so this next solution uses these four numbers, and same for here, to generate these next solutions. And I check if this solution is correct by uh, just plugging into the Pell equation, and I see that it equals 1218. I do the same for the rest, except for the numbers that are too big. They are so big that they uh, just equal zero at this point because the uh, precision is not good enough. Um, so I turn this back into the I turn the x and y back into m and m, uh, m and, and m. m. <laughs> I turn it back into the constants n and m that we wanted to get in the first place. And finally, we get our amplitude right here. Same for the other one. It's like this. Now, uh, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but everything uh, that everything about the pendulum behavior I mentioned so far, well, the angle the angle here is a float. It's a little tiny, but you can see that it's a four byte float, a single float. So, uh, I mean, everything's an integer, so it's fine to a certain point until only even numbers are permitted uh, around. Yeah, sorry, here we go. 16 million, uh, 16.7 million, yeah. So uh, we don't want anything larger than this. Uh, things will just break down. So none of this will work. This 13 digit number is too big. This 11 digit number is too big. So we're only left with three solutions right here. Zero, 500,000, and six million. Specifically, 507,000. 780 and the number of this video 620 uh sorry what 6 million 248 and 970 and that's our mega favorite number um this is the largest number such that even if you swing the pendulum for uh with an acceleration of 13 or an acceleration of uh, 42 you will hit angle equals zero, which is uh, pointing straight down, and uh, you can accelerate into the next uh, angle. This uh, I, I gotta give shout outs again. Uh, Trex found uh, like Trex taught me how to do this entire step by step uh, of this uh, of this main part of this video, which is amazing honestly and Creo realized that we uh, actually forgot half of the solutions which is these uh, which is uh, right here the X the, our base case solutions only was 42 and 1 we didn't realize that we can do plus and minus 42 and plus and minus 1 because of course you square them so yeah they're both gonna work so uh, with that we generated uh, double the amount of uh, solutions than we did before so that's how we found uh, there's also a 507,000 uh, amplitude that also has this property. But uh, the largest one, before the pendulum starts to behave uh, more erratically, is 6 million. And uh, got to give shout outs to Ever and uh, Frames and uh, who else was there? <laughs> there's a lot of people, but I think uh, the main people who helped out with, the, with my video commentary was uh, those two people. And Panacoke was there too, yeah. Panacoke also helped me out. I kind of just talked them through the entire concept. And he made this uh, image, by the way. I kind of modified it for my purpose, but uh, but he made this. Uh, and honestly, there's the script and, and all that. I just, uh, and here's my, here's just my spreadsheet. And that's, uh, that's all my work. That's, that's all of it. And the Desmos, Shasta, Desmos, and the uh, and the spreadsheets, <laughs> all of them. Check out Panon's video. <laughs> you should have watched it before watching this video. But uh, actually, no, you don't. 
I do go over all the concepts, but still, still it's a good video. You gotta check it out. And shout outs to Brahma Gupta and uh, yeah, I, and yeah, everyone else. I think that's it. That's. Uh, I hope I can upload this video in time. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how to end videos, but you know, I, I guess I have to give it one uh, one last shout out, and that is to you, you, you the viewers. Oh man, thanks for watching and click that like. <laughs> no, no, just just leave my channel. It sucks. This channel sucks. I hate <laughs> I hate making videos. <laughs> oh my god.